Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the CRISP speaker series on privacy. It's our great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Seda Gerses. Uh, Seda got her PhD in computer science in 2010 from KU Leuven in Belgium and is currently a postdoctoral researcher at Princeton University in their Center for Information Technology Policy. Uh, later this year she will be returning to KU Leuven as a post, uh, FWO postdoc researcher there. Uh, she will be talking to us about uh, privacy engineering. Let's welcome Seda. Uh, thank you so much, Ian, and thank you all for coming. This is a lovely invitation, and um, I'm very excited and nervous. Um, the first part of this talk um, is something, some material I feel more confident about, but I would love your feedback on. The second part is totally experimental. So if you get lost, it's my fault. So stop me and we'll go into the concepts and try to figure out what I was trying to say. Um, privacy is a rather hot topic. Uh, it comes in vogue and goes out of vogue again. Um, for, a, for a long time in the noughties, um, a, a bunch of people from Silicon Valley tried to declare it dead. And they were not alone. Like the media picked it up. This is a death of privacy. Academics picked it up as recently as last year said it's the end. Well, um, there have been a few things that happened that in the last few years that are maybe suggesting something else is going on, uh, especially responding to the idea that if you're pro-privacy, you're ag against progressivism, like you're anti-progressivist or Luddite or not understanding innovation. So the latest with the Apple versus FBI case, which can I assume everybody in this room has heard of, uh, of the unlocking of the phone and FBI requesting this. It seems like privacy is just coming back from the dead. So I thought the title of this talk should be Pet Cemetery. Pet refers to privacy enhancing technologies. If you're not from the field, this is a movie about zombie cats and humans. Um, and I think privacy is like this zombie that keeps on coming back even though there are parties that really want to kill it. But what's really great is that now a company like Apple can say, we're willing to create a product in which we will even not have your data. This is extremely radical, right? Like this is amazing. Um, the question is, how are they gonna manage to do that, right? So what does it mean to get let's say privacy engineering right. It's not so easy. We have been working on it in research and that's why we think if we wanna do privacy engineering, one of the things we can do is learn from privacy research that has been going on within computer science for at least the last 40 years, maybe even longer. Um, so what do I mean by privacy research? Basically looking at different sub-disciplines within computer science who claim they're doing privacy research. So that's a very open definition. Um, these parties within computer science may not think that the others are doing privacy research or they're doing it right, but that will be part of our discussion. Um, and I basically asked the question, what is privacy research in computer science? And did a systematic literature review, interviewed 42 people who claimed they're privacy researchers, and went to a bunch of conferences and workshops, and came up with what I thought were three paradigmatic approaches to privacy within computer science. So these I will call privacy as confidentiality, control, and practice, and I will step through them. So I'll start with the first and kind of oldest traditional one, which is privacy as confidentiality. In this paradigm, um, the, the most important assumption is that if you somehow disclose your information to any unintended party, your, your privacy is gone, right? And it's actually the, the, the kind of definition of privacy we use very intuitively many, many times. Like, um, you know, if there's an information leakage, we say your privacy is gone. Um, or if, you know, somebody could eavesdrop in your communications. Or if you use social networks, your privacy is gone, right? Um, and I will show that the two other paradigms have a very different definition that doesn't take this binary understanding of if you disclose, then privacy is gone. If you keep your data to yourself and to only intended parties, then your privacy is intact. Um, the definition, I think, borrows more or less from Warren and Brandeis' idea of the right to be let alone. So uh, enhancements or innovations in technology should not in increase the chances of privacy intrusions. Um, and some of the main principles that are like relevant to people who are doing research in this field is data minimization. So unless you absolutely need it, no information should be collected and no information should be inferred by unintended parties. Um, most of the time, um, the researchers working on, on privacy technologies that provide privacy as confidentiality, try to provide mathematical guarantees. Um, very importantly, they try to avoid single point of failure, so you don't want to depend on one party to make sure your privacy is intact. And one of the things they believe in is making your code and design open source so that many parties can look at it. And there are two reasons for this. Backdoors, have you heard of backdoors, everyone here? 
okay, so to make sure that there are no backdoors, but also kind of understanding it takes at least a village to keep something secure, right? So it's a very community-oriented uh, thing. Some examples are secure messaging and anonymous communications. Um, have you heard of Tor? So basically concealing uh, which websites you're communicating with, either concealing who you are from the website or allow, make, making sure third parties cannot observe who you're communicating with. And secure messaging, um, if it's without um, protection of your metadata, just making sure that your content can be, cannot be seen by any other than the intended parties. Um, and if it's with, with some good metadata protection, maybe also anonymously. So here's like a potential example. So I want to use online social network. Let's say it's Facebook. All of my data is unencrypted on Facebook. I mean, the whole idea is to share. But it turns out I want to maybe sometimes I use Facebook as an activist. So I want to make sure that I communicate with my friends A, B, and C in an encrypted manner. Um, so I encrypt the message actually only for friends A and B. I don't want C to maybe know I'm communicating with A and B, et cetera. So like, there are all these things that I can do by using privacy enhancing technologies. Um, and yeah, cryptogram is for encrypting images as an example, if you want to look that up. And CryptoCat has been much discussed if it actually provides you the protection that you need, but it will allow you to encrypt messages in chat. And I would add OTR here, uh, which is one of the greatest um, inventions that is also interoperable with a lot of these social networking sites and was actually founded by Ian Goldberg in the room. Okay, um, so the protection is here not only from online social networks, but eventually if a government goes over to on online social networks and says, give me the data, they have nothing to give, right? Um, and what's interesting here and important to keep in mind is that for people doing research in this field, the social network itself can be seen as an adversary or often is seen as an adversary, okay? This is very different from the next paradigm, let's call it privacy as control, where the idea is there is no way we can, not con we can um, live in the network societies that we live in without disclosing any information. So we're going to have to give information and actually oftentimes we're going to have to prove that we belong to certain networks in order to access other networks, right? If I want to rent a house, I'm going to have to show that maybe I have a registration somewhere and I have a bank account, right? Like, so there's all this interdependency. So we need ways to control information flows that go to service providers. And the way to do that is to basically increase the transparency of those organizations who are collecting our information, giving us control over when they collect information um, and, and how, how much they collect and who they share it with, um, and making sure that those organizations are transparent to us and to the rest of the world so that if they're abusing information they collected from us, we can identify it. Absolutely different model, right? Um, it is, I think, very much inspired uh, by an American scholar called Weston who came up with this definition of the right of the individual to decide what information about himself should be communicated to others and under what circumstances. Um, and it is also often relying on a legal enforcement to make sure that those organizations are not abusing your data. Um, so the legal enforcement in Europe would be data protection in the, in the US and I think also um, in Canada. I should have checked this. Do you have a FIPS or do you have a data protection law here in Canada? It's based on FIPS. They're all kind of based on FIPS. Yes, all right. So it would basically be solutions that interact somehow with the legal enforcement schemes. Um, and the objective of these solutions to be transparent, to make the organizations collecting and proce processing data to be transparent and accountable for what they promise you. Um, typical examples of this in computer science are privacy policy languages, um, basically uh, ways to either for, for organizations collecting data to express or users that are disclosing information to express their preferences as to what should be done with the information. And purpose-based access control would be, for example, within the organization to make sure that if they said they collect information for one purpose, they don't use it for another purpose. So you have an access control mechanism that controls that within the organization. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this paradigm is it believes in individual participation and control. And what that means is that I can go to an organization and say, what information do you have about me? Show me what you got. And I have the right to see what it is, ask you to correct it, ask you to delete it. And, and, and so those are kind of important elements, which leads to designs like this. Um, this is coming from Laurie Craner's group. Um, saying, okay, one of the problems we have um, with control uh, implementations is that a lot of websites, for example, will come with privacy policies. Have you seen privacy policies? Have you ever read them? 
No, you didn't. Come on. <laughs> okay, so they're unreadable. Um, they're also legalese. I actually doubt that they're meant for the end users, but these computer scientists took that very seriously. It said it's supposed to make the data practices of this organization transparent and accountable. So let's try to use a food label sort of design and put it in there so that users can just scam, skin over, skim over it and decide for themselves if they want to join or not. Of course, there are hundreds of studies that show people join anyways, even if they don't like the data practices, there are all sorts of problems. But the point is this is an area of research that people are trying to improve privacy as control. Now, the third paradigm is one that I have very, um, very often heard is difficult to um, kind of understand because it's, it's, it's much softer um, and much more social in its understanding, and many, few of you will have heard examples of it. So here, um, what, the, what the researchers are trying to address is the way in which privacy norms that we may have among us are disrupted as a result of the introduction of technology, and trying to find ways to give us the op opportunity to re redraw the boundaries of privacy in a reasonable way among us, right? Um, what's kind of a social norm in this room with respect to privacy? Any, any ideas? Kat, you have an idea? What am I not doing? Because I, there would kind of be a boundary negotiation, uncomfortable boundary negotiation privacy. Cross taking and broadcasting pictures of people? That would be one thing, or if I would start talking in very fun details about my life or saying something very, very detailed about Ian's life, it would be kind of awkward, right? So we know that we should not be disclosing certain information, but then sometimes a technology comes in um, and all of a sudden discloses what my private conference, I say like if I had this microphone on and I'm talking with Ian about some of my secrets and it's on the video, right? Then, <laughs> then the, the technology has mediated this privacy negotiation. And the question is how can we like change this technology so it makes me aware that it's here and I don't start telling my secrets to Ian and, and get it on tape, right? So these are the questions that these communities are asking. So what they would like to know is how they can make systems somehow transparent to the users, so not the information practices, but more of the organization, so where they whether how much data they collect and how they share it with third parties, but much more about, you know, what will my friends in online social networks see from my profile? How can I kind of make that evident and, and kind of transparent to the end users? Um, so the objective is to improve the user's agency, so like the power of the user to negotiate their pri privacy boundaries within social settings. Um, and the assumption here is that within each um, collective, what counts as privacy may be very different. So this idea that if you disclose one bit, you have lost your privacy is not part of this paradigm. And this idea that if you control everything, um, then privacy is there is not quite in it either. It's about collective information practices. So if I may be, um, you know, in a, in a group that, what would be a good example, um, exchanges information about, you know, problems I'm having in my marital life, right? Um, if that's what the, what the objective is of that online social network, then it's not seen as a violation of privacy, right? Like, and if you just make sure that your partners don't find out the discussion, you've done a good job with the design. Okay. Other researchers actually focus on something else, which they call aid in privacy decision making. So they say that privacy is not something um, that you decide on the moment, but it's a practice that comes over time. So if we give users examples of mistakes or things they've done in the past, they can learn from that and change their privacy practices in the future. Does that make somewhat sense? It's, it's a little different. Now, I'll explain why it's different. So here's some examples from the communities there. Um, so these guys uh, are suggesting that control should not be in a separate page. So if you're using an online social network, you shouldn't have to go to a privacy page and change your privacy settings, but they should be contextual. Um, and, and then if you're going to, for example, um, put something on, online that you know, might be contentious, then it gives you a little bit of a moment to reflect, right? And if you look at these examples, you will see Facebook has all the data they had before, and a government can still intercept it, or there might be inferences made. What has changed is the social practice. That's the place, that's the, that's the kind of space in which they're intervening. Here's another example. So they would have a counter. You have 10 seconds to cancel after you post this update, right? Like, so maybe you put something, you were angry, and it gives you a little chance to kind of take it back. Um, and this one, um, oh wait, I don't have the next, I didn't put the next slide, anyways. 
There was another one which shows who else might see, see your post. And then there was one that the researchers worked on where it would look at the emotion that was kind of expressed in the, in the, in the message and say, you sound a little angry. Maybe you shouldn't post this message. And guess what? The users who use that found it very intrusive, right? So they actually felt, felt their privacy was intruded by this tool that was supposed to help them with their privacy. So like, it's not easy to get privacy engineering right. OK, so um, I hope I, I could somehow convince you that there, these are very, three, very different approaches. They have very different definitions of privacy. Their understanding of the problem is absolutely varied. And as a result, the solutions they come up with are different as well. It's also interesting that a lot of the people here come from security engineering um, and, and, and also I think a lot from crypto. I think that's a, here's like security and systems crossing and here you have, a, and in both of them you have HCI people moving back and forth basically. So as a result, they bring in the methods and techniques of their disciplines and therefore that's part of the reason why they have different privacy problems and privacy solutions. So one could say, this is all great. Um, that means that we have like a diversity in what is understood as privacy problems and that is actually also reflect, re reflected in law, it's reflected in philosophy, it's reflected in social sciences. So computer scientists have done great. They have noticed that it's a, it's a difficult problem with many um, different parts and they have a variety of solutions. But we do think that there are also some shortcomings. One of them is integration. Um, so most of these communities work almost in silos and they don't work with each other very much and also sometimes they contest each other's definition of privacy. This is a big problem. So let's go back to the example with social networks. Let's say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a researcher working in the practice paradigm and I want to make photo tagging the best way, right? Like I want to make sure that if I say, if I tag a photo of Ian, Ian gets a message that says you can untag yourself or another option is I tag the photo, it, it gets uploaded and Ian can later go and untag himself or the picture doesn't go on until ta the tag has been approved by Ian. Those are three different designs and they're likely to improve our relationship or make it worse depending on what we think is the appropriate social norm, right? So a lot of research and actually a lot of um, industry works on making this relationship as comfortable as possible so that a photo that is tagged will be uploaded, right? So that means they have solved the social privacy problem, solved, they've comforted the users, but they have actually not addressed the information asymmetry that goes on with the organizations that are collecting this data and let's say a government later coming to say, give me all pictures of Ian and now they get it. Right? So the fact that these, these issues are, are treated separately can have negative effects. So what we would like to see is researchers think about how these things are integrated and we would like practitioners to also not think about one level only. Um, you can imagine the other way around as well. If you have like a, a crypto protocol that you know, makes sure no third party sees anything, but socially it's a disaster, <laughs> right? It kind of signals to the, all the other parties you don't trust them. Let's say when I encrypt a message on a social network wall and everybody sees there's a gibberish and they're like, what are you doing? What are you trying to signal to me? That might also be a reason not to adopt this technology. So you need to kind of balance these things and we'd like to see that happen. The other thing that has been missing, and this has a lot to do with how university and research institutions are constructed, um, is that a lot of times technologies will be developed or implemented by, let's say, PhD students and little effort is put into how that engineering process can be systematized so others can implement this technology as well, right? Like, and I'm not just talking about pushing out the code, but actually thinking about how can I systematize the development so that others can go through the steps, go through the motions and develop these technologies. Also generalize so that they can be applied in, great, in, in maybe more domains or in different contexts than the one that is in the univers university context. The last thing where I think we have somewhat failed is to think about how we can make sure that these tools that we develop or techniques that we develop as researchers become part of the toolbox of engineers in general, right? So we haven't done enough work there. Um, partially because university research doesn't incentivize any of these things, right? Um, so we thought we can try to incentivize it. We have now a workshop <laughs> called International Workshop for Privacy Engineering and we're basically trying to reward people who think about systematizing how you develop privacy technologies, right? Making that knowledge available to people who are not experts and who are not getting amazing mentorship from professors who know what this is and where it's going. 
Um, so here's our definition, and this is open to all of you to criticize, and I hope that you will think along with us. So privacy engineering we are currently defining as a field of research and practice that designs, implements, adapts, and evaluates theories of privacy, right? So there are different theories of privacy. I can go back to that later. Methods, techniques, and tools to systematically capture and address privacy issues when developing socio-technical systems. Now, that's a lot of words and you might fall asleep, so let me wake you up. So <laughs> there are very different theories of privacy, right? So um, some people think it is control, like Weston believed that it was about controlling flows of information. Helen Nissenbaum uh, would, for example, say contextual integrity. She will say, um, give this very exa good example of, co in some context, it's appropriate for some information to flow and not others. When I go to my doctor, it's appropriate for me to tell very excruciating details about, let's say, my bodily fluids. It's not appropriate for my doctor to tell me things about their bodily fluids, right? So, um, so her theory is not that, again, it's a lot, all about control, but it's about how do we make systems that respect the contextual norms, right? And you can imagine technologies from all three paradigms helping us do that. But that means that we need to think about the specific theory we're subscribing to when we're engineering solutions. What are we trying to solve? And then there's a question of what is the difference between methods, techniques, and tools. So let me just try to step through this, and then I will criticize this in the second half of the, of the talk. So by methods, can you read this? I'm sorry, the, the, the blue and white was maybe not the best. The colors are all from the Pet Cemetery poster, by the way. Like, if they don't work, it's because of the bad design of the Pet Cemetery poster. All right, so um, this is approaches for systematically cap capturing addre and addressing privacy issues um, during development, management, and maintenance of systems, right? So this is basically different steps you can take from the beginning and end of, let's say, the development of a system or a feature or what have you. So it's like, it's a comprehensive steps and guidance that you can have. One of the first papers on this was in 2009, I believe. Yeah, it's from Sarah Speakerman and uh, Lori Craner. Um, and it's, it's fascinating because they basically say there are two things you can do. You can do privacy as control and you can do privacy as confidentiality. They don't have much on privacy as practice somehow. And then they suggest that the guidelines they give can be used by everyone. So it can be used by Google and the person who's making a little app and the person who's doing internet standards, which is crazy, but they propose that, right? Like, so our objective is that people will start building methods that are very specific to, spe to domains, but also different kind of software engineering practices. Do I have 20 people who are gonna do privacy engineering or is the guy who does like DevOps also gonna like look into privacy? Is there a legal team that's gonna work with them or is it not? So that totally changed the method that we propose. Okay, then techniques come that they're for specific tasks that you're going to do that will support you either by giving your prescribed language or notation to accomplish this ta uh, task. Um, so at the first privacy engineering um, workshop, we had this paper by Marit Hansen and her co-authors. And this, would, this was a technique that they proposed that would help engineers reconcile tensions between different privacy goals. So if you wanted to have unlinkability and transparency, how do you work through this, right? So it was just a very cute little technique with vocabulary that engineers could use. And the last thing we, can, we have thought about is tools. And by this we mean, um, ideally automated means that support the engineers during part of a privacy engineering process. Um, and the lovely paper that we had here was Tor Experimentation Tools. It was from Fatima Shirazi and her co-authors. And the obje objective was to um, assess the performance um, of experimental techniques and tools that engineers can use who are actually working on the performance of Tor, right? And this is challenging because worries, maybe you can look at the performance of a network and not have many privacy worries, which you should, but most people don't. Tor researchers actually are very concerned about how they can do this analysis in a privacy-preserving way. <coughs> and Fatema and her authors were evaluating the different options, trying to say when it would be appropriate to use different kinds of tools for this process. Okay. Um, and I also said that this is about building socio-technical systems. And this is a little tricky. I hope this is a complete list. So you can imagine that you might be building standalone privacy technologies. And I would say Tor, for example, is a standalone privacy technology. And again, this could be um, rethought. You might be trying to enhance a privacy system. For example, if you have a ho hospital uh, information management system, you might be doing things either to become compliant or make sure that there are no leakages and that users have good control. This could be doctors and nurses and what have you. Um, 
or research into privacy violations. So a good number of researchers look at, can you de-anonymize data sets? Or they look at what kind of web tracking is going on. And what they try to capture in that case is not what organizations or specific groups can do, but if we have an ecosystem of technologies, are there emergent privacy violations that we can only understand because we study them systematically? I would say these are all the kind of research and, and engineering that needs to be happening under the, under the title of privacy engineering. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Um, we'll have the second privacy engineering workshop coming up soon. And here are three topics that were discussed at the last one, um, which are worthy of research. So if you're interested in these topics, please uh, come talk to me afterwards or run with it. Uh, one is empirical studies. Remember I talked about the Craner and Speakerman paper. They were suggesting this methodology that could be used everywhere. Well, we really, really need to understand how the sausage is made in different organizations. How is software developed in a startup versus in Google versus in um, a mobile phone company? These are very different. Um, um, environments and what kind of methodologies, techniques, and tools can be helpful really requires us to do empirical studies. Another one is machine learning and engineering. We found that most of the methods, techniques, are, and tools are for the moment of collection, and some of them for management, but very few of them are about processing and inferences that can be made and where we can like think about levers for either privacy, discrimination, or um, fairness issues in, in large databases. Um, and the third one is metrics. So how do we know if a privacy technology that we developed is working? How do we know if we enhance the privacy of a system? How do we measure these things? So we need to develop frameworks and me metrics for evaluating the things that we produce. And we don't have enough of that right now. OK. Everyone coming along? Any questions so far? Anything that pops in your mind where you're like, I think this is privacy engineering too, or I think this is too wide of a definition. I can give you the definition again for a moment, just a little pause. Okay. So we asked the question in the beginning when I told you all of these things, uh, what can privacy research do for privacy engineering? But what if we turn that question around? What can privacy researchers learn from software engineering practice? And here, um, I have to introduce an elephant in the room, um, which is that most of computer science research does not see software engineering as part of its scientific tradition. In the sense that I've heard in many rooms, it's vanilla science. You will not get hired if you're a software engineer. I'm a requirements engineer, so I will not get hired. That's kind of working out so far. But it also rarely, in computer science, we also rarely recognize that the transfer of knowledge can be the other way around. I did find some papers that do that but it was very, very rare, okay? So by asking this question, is there something to learn? Um, I, I hope that I'm asking like a bigger challenge, like how should we do research and how should it be informed by the practice that is out there? Um, okay, so the question that I'm asking is, are there predict paradigmatic shifts in how the sausage is made, so how software is engineered, that has an impact on privacy research? So that's the most important question I want to ask in the second part. And this is, we're going into experimental domain now. I have not presented this work before, um, so you have to stop me if it doesn't make sense. So I think there are two shifts that I want to look at. Um, one is a shift from shrink wrap software to services. Who knows what shrink wrap software is? Anyone? Yes? Tell me what it is. <laughs> it's software you buy a box with shrink wrap wrap. That's lovely. That's a great definition of shrink wrap software. Is there another one that we have in the room? What's different? What? Oh, right. OK, it's, it's a software that you buy in a box that is shrink-wrapped. Or downloaded from the internet. Or downloaded from the internet, yes? You don't update it. Typically, you don't update it. And there's like head shaking going on. I can also repeat that. Anything else? Generally, you're running it on your own computer. Generally, you're running it on your own computer. And under what circumstances? Can everybody see what you're doing? No. Generally not, service. Right, OK. So you guys already know kind of what I'm going for. The other thing I want to talk about, which I think goes hand in hand with this, is the shift within software engineering uh, from the waterfall model to agile programming. Um, and I will introduce all of these things to you. So let's start with shrink wrap software. Who knows what this is? 
<laughs> that is correct. This is the launch. Um, <laughs> This is the launch of Windows 95, OK? Um, oh, shoot. I, I want it back. It's so lovely. I mean, there are like multiple videos, but it's, Bill, I mean, it, I, it's not a video about white men can't dance, OK? <laughs> so um, they actually lit up the Empire State Building in New York, saying, we have Windows 95, right? Like, so versions, right? Versions of software, shrink wrap, right? Like, it was a big deal. It's something you manage always two years too late, right? Like, so <laughs> shrink wrap software. But we have moved on. Something has happened, right? And, and I tried to kind of figure out what has happened. And I'm sorry for the really full slide. This is where you notice that this is the first time. So let's just try to give a definition. So in shrink wrap, the binary runs solely on the client side. So these were things that were said in the, in the room. So what does that mean? So it requires that the software and hardware are somewhat matching. So that's already quite a challenge. The updates and maintenance are cumbersome. We had somebody say there are no updates, um, which is seriously bad for security, right? If, especially if your device is networked. Um, user has control, oh no. Um, and you pay in advance, or you pay when you get the box, right? The transaction has a very clear time uh, limit, which is when you get the box. And our wonderful example is Microsoft Word. Um, on the other hand, we have services. Um, the model is based mainly on server and client model, and actually it's a thin client. Um, the idea is that the data is secured by service. They can update and maintain everything for the user. Super convenient. It's great for collab collaboration. All the users can actually share the data if they want to. And you pay as you use, which means that you can try it out. And if you don't like it, you can put it away. And you didn't waste all the money you paid in advance, right? Um, and the example that we would have there is, you know, Office 360, Google Docs, or whatever you want to call it. And there, of course, like, this is a continuum, right? Um, you know, enterprise software is still kind of shrink wrappy. That's like when companies kind of buy their own IT stuff, or maybe they outsource it. Um, and apps on our phones, for example, are somewhere in between because you still have to download, you still have to update. They're trying to automate that. And not all the data will go to the services, uh, will go to the service provider, right? So whereas here, like if you're using Microsoft Word, occasionally Microsoft Word might call home, but in Office 360, basically every click is known to the service provider. Okay, so why am I so fixed on services? So this is just kind of like where these things came from. Um, and I'm I'm not done with this part, but I can just tell you that service-oriented architectures was more of a management idea. Agile development methods is called a bottom-up thing of like, and I don't think so, but like that's what it's called. And cloud is a third part of the piece, which I'm not going to talk about much here, because you can do services without the cloud, but like the cloud is kind of even further complicating things. And what we have is software as a service, which I want to see as like, what is that shift to agile methods and software as a service doing to us? OK. Um, oh, maybe I have to tell you one thing. Services is not new. Does anybody know what the first new services were? Yeah. Say it again. Time sharing services. So big firms would hire IBM machines, and they would be charged for CPU time and processing. Um, and it's really fun. Did you, who knows the birth date of software? This is really great. This is really important information. Everybody should know this. 23rd of June, 1969. Until then, IBM would bundle the software with its hardware. Actually, most hardware, software was a thing that came for free with hardware. It's not until like this unbundling uh, of IBM because they were basically under um, a huge lawsuit which had like hundreds of thousands of pages from their lawyers, from IBM lawyers, that IBM was like, oh shit, they're coming after us. And they basically said, okay, there is a thing called software. In the beginning, nobody wanted to pay money for it. It wasn't something that was a commodity, right? So like these things go through changes and now they're like people in media studies saying software has disappeared into infrastructure. And in a sense, that's what's happening with, with the cloud, right? Like with the cloud, hardware is becoming infrastructure. It's becoming something we don't see that just kind of does the work for us. And so Software is becoming a cascade of services. So where is software? Right? So it's a very interesting question, um, but I won't meddle with it too much more. Okay, so 
Um, the methodology for this part is kind of classical SETA methodology. So I basically do a lot of literature review. Um, I've been looking at online courses on software engineering and how to build so services. Um, I really recommend the course from Armando Fox, if you want to look that up, that's from UC Berkeley. And I've been doing interviews with people who are mostly developing services, but not only. Um, and so far, I've done eight interviews with de developers or people who call themselves DevOps, product managers, data engineers, people who are doing A-B testing or uh, developing AI products. And we also spoke um, with four people who say they're developing privacy technologies. Um, and the focus of the study is on basically consumer-facing technologies and not how B2B works together and how they do services and privacy, uh, services and how they engineer things there. Okay, so I'm gonna skip the part about services, how they came into being, but go into how um, basically agile programming techniques came into being. So here is the famous waterfall model. Um, everybody know what the waterfall model is? Does anybody know why we had the waterfall model? Why do you think we have this like very rigid step by step? I first have a very clear specification, then I go to design, then I implement, then I verify and operate in maintenance. Consultants. Consultants. What else? It also came out of some of the large projects. Like a bunch of that stuff came out of NASA's work. That's correct. What else? There's no correct answer. Like there are many answers. Yes? That is correct. So you have to imagine, remember we said hard, hardware and software were bundled, they were very together. And, if, and it was basically people who were kind of slowly emerging as people who do software. And, and they took a lot of their practices probably from hardware. Oh boy, okay, 10 minutes. All right, so, um, <laughs> okay, so we started with this waterfall model. Um, it turns out it was not very efficient. I think like early numbers were that like over 70% of projects failed. Um, Failed meant like either they never came to being or they um, were late or cost like twice as much and stuff like that. Um, and then people also noticed that 60% of software co cost is maintenance and of that 60% is adding new functionality. Um, so basically there's a great interest in being able to bring the cost down on that maintenance thing, right? Make it possible and easier. So here comes to their help, Agile Manifesto, right? It seems like it's a bottom-up thing, but you can imagine this is all about productivity and responding to market needs. So Agile Manifesto says we should stop working, focusing so much on process and tools, but we should focus on individuals and interactions. We should make sure that there's working software instead of like all this documentation, which for example, NASA needs, but you know, like if you're just giving it a little service or, or app on your phone, do you really need all this documentation? Um, it should be about customer collaboration instead of the bosses negotiating contracts and it should respond to change instead of following a plan. They write this and then extreme programming guy comes in, in 400 pages he says this is all wrong um, and, and says we need to be much more extreme than what agile is promising. We should make very short iter I I iterations of software um, so make them as short as possible, make things very very simple and this is where they match services, right? Services says make simple functions that can be bundled together with others. Um, and make sure that testing is there all the time and make sure their code reviews all the time. Okay, so you're probably asking yourself, okay, why is all this fluffy management stuff relevant to privacy research? And I'm gonna throw a really ugly slide at you um, because a bunch of things are happening. Both the services people, they're the blue ones, and the agile development people have an interest in the server client model, right? They want this because they want to, on the one hand, decrease the, the cost of maintenance, and, and here they want to have a better business model, right? Um, the server side people um, propose to bundle services, and they want a new licensing and pricing model, right? You don't buy the software anymore, you actually pay for it as you use it. Um, so basically your transaction time is no longer when you bought the box, it's throughout your use, right? Um, and that means that you can now optimize the customer as long as they're using your software. So you can constantly predict what they're going to do and how much money you can get out of them. So that gives you data business models. So data is not only interesting for advertisement, but it's also interesting for your internal business model. All of this requires intensified tracking because I offer a service, 
um, let's say I'm offering signal as secure messaging, but I'm also going to use a 3D bar scanner, right? Maybe I'm going to pay for that. That means now I need to track all the users that are using that so that I can pay the 3D bar, 3D bar scanning software provider, right? That means I need to track all of my users and if possible across devices. They installed Spotify on their computer and their phone. I need to know that this is the same person so I don't charge them twice. Okay. On the other side, we have the agile developers. They want to have reuse and modularity. They want rapid feature development. This is great for maintenance, right? Remember, most of maintenance was about features and their maintenance. They want to do all sorts of testing. And now they have all this data. So they can test on users all the time. So what we have is the rise of behavioral testing. I can look to see how features are performing and constantly optimize them depending on what I want to achieve with them. And the last bit I will almost skip, you no longer has, have files as a user, you have just some random abstract data, right? Like something is being collected about you. De developers still see files, but for users that doesn't exist. I'll focus on two of these very quickly. So two things are going on, the data-centric development. Remember I said testing kind of brings in this user, user and behavioral analytics. Um, and, but there are two things, there are in two directions reasons why this is happening. One is I want to do predictive modeling for pricing, right? Remember the new business model? So I want to keep on looking at user churn and figure out how much I'm going to pay them. So I uh, make them pay the user. So I'm keeping on making data centric. Um, I have an interest in that data, right? And I want to make sure that the features I develop are actually being accepted and increasing my, my profits. So I'm going to do a lot of behavioral anal analytics. For that, um, I don't want to rely on user anecdotes because I also want to scale to millions of users, so I'm going to develop metrics, okay? Um, I'm going to skip the fact that all of this behavioral stuff is coming from some relationship with NIST and NSA, but I can tell you about that later if you want. Okay, so what is happening here is basically looking at user metadata is becoming an intrinsic part of software engineering. And this is, this is why I told you all of this, right? So if we want to give privacy technologies, if we want to develop privacy technologies and we want to be like careful about metadata, we have to literally now change engineering practices. That's a huge challenge. And it's not just a technical one, right? It's like a software culture one. Okay, the next one um, is, I'll skip parts of this, um, is that inflation of features. Remember now you're having sprints, the, the, use, the developers are coming together every week, maybe they're standing, having standing meetings every day, and they're coming up with new features every day, and they're maybe launching 20 of them every week. So there's nothing constant, there's no beginning and end. The waterfall model, right, you had a beginning and end, which most of the computer science researchers work with is no longer there, right? Um, and so, one, some researchers noticed this and they asked the question. Did they, they said, does this amazing churn of code lead to more security problems, right? Um, in this paper, they looked at Firefox, which moved from um, you know, traditional software engineering to rapid release of features. And they noticed that with this move, they can't apply traditional security frameworks that standards organizations have proposed. You can't do threat modeling. You can't do risk assessment and code maturity. Like, you want to just ship it, right? So there's not, you know, not much happening with respect to waiting to see how the code does. What their study shows is, yes, it's true that there is more vulnerability in the code and the code is potentially immature, but actually they're not getting more vulnerabilities you know, in the databases where vulnerabilities are re registered. They think because of the honeymoon time that it takes attackers to learn the vulnerabilities because new code is coming all the time. Does that make sense, right? Okay, so this is, this is kind of crazy because it's like, how much can you depend on this? But this is a very interesting paper because it's asking, this change happened, what does that mean for the way we do security? Where we say you should do security from the beginning. There's no beginning, right? Like, you should do code maturity and you should check all of these things. It, it's not happening and what's happening to security? So they're asking very interesting questions about assumptions that are fundamental to security research. Maybe we should do the same for privacy. So if we go back to the paradigms, so let's ask about data minimization. Well, we, I just told you that all of these services collect as much data as possible. Um, let's say properties with mathematical guarantees. Maybe we can do that for services, but we have an environment with multiple parties. Remember, there's a gatekeeper for multiple services, and there are new features. So there are all these moving parts. 
And we're saying avoid single point of failure, but what does that mean when a service is a bundled thing? So these questions, maybe we need to ask, or we need to say, we want these things, so we need to resist these things. Those are two options, but we, we need to be asking these questions. Um, so here, what is happening? Um, yeah, I wanted to, remember the food label stuff? I wanted to one, have one that like lit up like a Christmas tree because like if there are new features all the time, that label is changing. So, <laughs> right? But I, I'm not a designer and I didn't have time. But basically, um, services put a lot of pressure on the traditional idea of data protection. Purpose specification is out the window, right? Um, and so uh, these guys have a huge problem, but they're not dealing with it yet. And, um, and here, it's interesting with the privacy as practice, if I have the whole stack of software and I notice that users are finding something intrusive, it's great, I can just change it. I can change it on the spot. So this is actually really great for these guys on some level. But then we have to think about what it means to have agency when I'm being manipulated with A-B testing all the time, right? So they're, again, like very fundamental questions that we need to be asking. So I hope that I, kind of convinced you that if we look at software engineering practice, we can learn something about assumptions we make about where our technologies are going to exist and how we do computer science research. Um, my upcoming steps, this is ongoing research, is to look at papers coming out of um, computer science that say they're privacy research and see if they recognize these shifts or pay due respect to the ch shifts and address the challenges. And my suspicion is some people are going to be like, my method is for everything in the world, right? Like they're not going to look at the shift at all. And some people are going to be like, I'm still thinking of a waterfall model. I have a technology and it will start somewhere and will end and it will launch. And I'm sure that I, I'm pretty sure I will find a lot of that. And then I will find a lot of people who recognize the shift to services and apps, but they still work with conceptions of privacy that do not do justice to the challenges. And I will talk about that as the last thing to confuse you. Um, but the last one is I think that, and this will be hard to measure, that certain kind of privacy technologies are going to flourish more than others. So this will be an interesting evaluation to do. For some technologies, it will be harder to survive in this environment than others, but maybe this is something that time will show, but I want to ask that question. And the thing I wanted to confuse you with <laughs> before ending is that we think of privacy on some level very spatially, right? How many, know, how many of you know Lightbeam? It's a plug-in for Firefox, so every time you go to a website, it tells you which third parties collected data about you. OK. This is very spatial. Like, my data went to this other place called Google or CNN and whatever. With features, what's happening is my data is being used to change my behavior over time. So most of the privacy concepts, and this is something very, very theoretical, and if you don't understand this and it confuses you, you can forget it as soon as the talk is over. I think we need to think about what it means to do privacy with temporal effects, right? What is it? if technologies are either limiting or enabling me to behave in a certain way? And can we see that as part of privacy problem? I don't know, but let's think about that. Um, or I can give you an example. If a feature that I really depend on disappears, I did not lose any data, but it might fundamentally affect my autonomy and independence. Okay, so that's an example. All right, so the end is basically some questions. Is it valuable to Im explore the impact of current software engineering practices? I think it is, and you can tell me if I convinced you or not. Um, should we be aware of or wary of this paradigmatic shift? Should we be resisting it or going along with it and thinking about ways of doing privacy technologies there? Um, and is resistance futile? <laughs> so can we really go against some of these things when Basically, it has become common to watch users' mouse clicks, uh, mouse movement, cursor movement as a metric. If that has become that, like, how, does it make sense to say, well, we shouldn't do that? Like, how, or how do we make, it, make sure that it makes sense, right? Like, these are very hard questions. Okay, so that's my talk. I thank you. This is the workshop um, URL. That's my email address, and these are all the collaborators of this project. Thanks. Thank you. I know it's a lot of material and I usually kind of overwhelm. <laughs> Any thoughts?
Do you buy it? I mean, like, maybe you're skeptical. Should I continue doing this research? Or <laughs> is it too high level? Can I be more specific? Any ideas? So I really like the, the insight that by looking at the software engineering uh, practices that we see what, um, what private information and what mm -hmm. uh, autonomy is being taken away from mm -hmm. individuals and used in the software, just in the normal, so now norm, the new normal right. software engineering uh, life cycle and uh, that we have to work with this new reality that if we're going to protect uh, people and their privacy and their data, mm -hmm. that uh, we need to know what we're protecting it against, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And that's, uh, I thought that was a very good thing. Cool. Any further thoughts? Yes? I'm wondering, like, is it not enough for software to be open source? I mean, I think it has to be like widely deployed and used for it to be like a Otherwise, people will know that you're using this sort of software. And sometimes just knowledge of it is enough to kind of duplicate you or just be someone's crosser. Can you be more specific about what you're thinking? I think I know what you're thinking about, but just, uh, all right. So the question is, is it enough for a software to be open source when maybe a few people are using it and you will be implicated just by virtue of using it? Is that correct? And I asked for an example. This is for the camera. I'm not just, you know, disrespectful of the audience. Like right. Like, uh, you know, WhatsApp versus some other, you know, like uh, if it's deployed in, in a big, like, uh, uh, like a software versus something, you know, like uh, open source that's only a very few people use. And so it will, you know, like kind of, like, you know, people will, will think, well, why are you, you know, doing this? And what's, that's very strange. You know, so so if, if, if it's like widely deployed, like, you know, like WhatsApp, some other service, then basically it will not, like, um, I mean, you know, this will, uh, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, your suggestion is that for the privacy as confidentiality paradigm that it is not sufficient, that it's open source, yeah. but that it also should be used by many people. And, and I think like that wisdom is very much known to that community, especially since like the whole beginning of Tor was to build a secure communication network for intelligence agents, agents to use. And they noticed that if only intelligence agents are using that channel, then it kind of beats the purpose. And that's why they wanted a diversity of users. So this is how it has at least been partially explained to me. And I think this is very clear. Um, I think that um, they're challenging decisions, right? Like the Signal people, for example, now, do you know what Signal is? It's, it's, yeah, it's an app which allows you to have encrypted communication so that no third party can see the contents of your communication. Um, and one decision they made is now, you know, when you turn Signal on and if you have a phone number where somebody doesn't have Signal, it says, say hi to them and make them install, I mean, like, tell them they should install Signal. And here's somebody shaking her head, right, and cat. I was actually and, rolling my eyes and I rolled them so hard my whole head. Right, okay, so she was rolling her eyes and she rolled them so hard that her head moved. Okay, so um, basically um, there are two responses. One is that, and the other one is to say, the more people are using it, the better it is for those who really need it because they can hide within the crowd. And you can see that already it alienates some of their users that are coming from this very strong privacy tradition and maybe it welcomes others. And so these are things that we're going to have to learn from each other and they're not just technical. They show that we are actually looking at a socio-technical problem. I don't have an answer, but that's a very good point. Yeah. Yes. Right. So the question, the is is this a question or a comment? Question. Okay. How will you explore that, or will you just assume going forward that our view, our paradigm today on privacy is correct? And it's a question of how do we maintain it. Mm -hmm. or how are you going to uh, like, fight with the idea that maybe we should be more open, maybe we should close some other ideas? Right. So which privacy norms that have over? I, I will try. I think this is what you said. Um, 
so there are privacy norms that have been established, let's say, I mean, it cha they change all the time. And by now, we have come accustomed to sharing many things. Yeah. Like, for example, like somebody earning somebody's salary. I think that, for some period of time, was pretty confidential. So we can talk openly about your earnings. Right. Um, and I think now we're moving a little bit more, especially in some communities where people talk openly about their earnings. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily bad. It could even be liberating or helping. Right. And so that's one example where something that used to be private is now become less private. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, for example, the example that was given was that now we might be more comfortable making public or more public our earnings, our salaries, and that could be a liberating thing, or it could be it could allow us to talk about income inequality, for example, right? Um, so what what it, what should be our goals, right? Is that? Yeah. So like, how do we determine our goals? Mm -hmm. You could say, okay, this is something that now should be open and it's fine to be open. Right. So, yeah. Does that make sense to your question? No, I think it's a complicated question. That's the thing, right? Like, who should determine social norms? Uh, that's a very hard one. Are we as technologists co determining social norms? Absolutely, right? Like, so that, that is the first answer. Um, I think, so one of the things we've been talking about. Um, it's unrelated but related to what you just said, is, is the metaphors we use for privacy. Like some people talk about pollution and they say like things are very polluted now and we're gonna be messed up for the next 10 years. That's actually the Cory Doctorow article that I quoted in the abstract. Um, and some people talk about like how um, users need to kind of pull themselves together and do the right thing and they compare it to eating good food, right? Um, and, and, and there are all these studies that say users don't care about their privacy, they give away their data willingly, um, and so that's compared to, you know, occasionally or more likely than not eating not so good food, right? Like the fries and burger, like isn't it fun? Um, but I think as engineers we need another metaphor, which is that we need to make sure we produce good food, and then if people want to do something else, uh, we should give them that option. So as co-creators of social norms, I think that we should be very aware of government's intention to collect this data, all of the normalization of this surveillance through companies that make it very playful to collect data, and we should think about what, our what a responsible response would be, and I can't give that, it needs to be put together collectively. We produce that, and then the users still have the choice to liberate themselves. They can still write their salary <laughs> or whatever, but we need to give them the technologies that if they don't want to disclose something, that is possible. Having said that, like I do not want to want corporations to have privacy rights. So like, um, so there, there are like different tensions there as to, you know, um, you know, in some countries it is absolutely required to disclose your salary, like in some of the Scandinavian countries, because that is seen as part of a fair society. And I think those are bigger questions that are not just about privacy, but about what makes good information flows for a fair society. And that's an even bigger question. Yeah. Yes. Do, do we have any more here? Sorry, I'm happy to give you. No. Okay, go for it. So, like, uh, I'm kind of skeptical how, like, uh, how seriously like privacy engineering is taken within industry. Because, for example, like uh, you mentioned feature agreement, all the features people have to file on before right. security. I'm wondering if money is, is a, like a, itself is like, a, like a, an issue because, for example, Apple, I mean, they uh, you know they did not like uh, they, they claim the software is secure and, and encrypted and all that. Um, now we learn it's not actually you can you know update the firmware. Right. Devices. And why do they do that? Do that? And well, I think otherwise, I think maybe because if they break their devices, and you know, they have to basically uh, go to all the, like, the customers and and like uh, and actually like uh, take you know take the devices if they break them from some uh, uh, software update method, then they have to go to the like to manually to, manual to their, all the customers and like uh, you know, take care of the, all the phones. So I mean you know they claim one thing, but I think like, otherwise. Right, so to, I think I hear two things. So are, is industry really interested in privacy engineering or is it just a marketing thing? Because if we look at what happened with Apple, it seems like they didn't really secure the phone, but they made a big burrara about like how that's very important to them. Is that approximately? Okay, so um, different things. So I think that when, when, when industry says they're interested in privacy, um, they often mean these two things. 
right? They're saying that they have a legal team that will like document where the data goes. And now, you know, there's a lot of interesting research talking about how you implement policies, like the policy of a company, um, in a kind of updatable fashion. So they're coming up with automated tools that are like, oh, you have a new feature, you need new data, we'll update the policy automatically and it will go through all the databases. So it basically creates procedures for transparency, but it doesn't create procedures for, um, let's say, purpose specification, like sticking to why you collected data and not all of a sudden using it for something else. Like they're leaving these things out strategically. So that's happening a lot here. And there's a lot of work, um, and I would almost see some of the things Apple was doing to comfort the user, right? Like um, I think industry has different definitions. Privacy is not surprising the user, right? <laughs> right? And, and so, um, you know, if I'm going to use uh, biometrics in, in my system, how do I introduce it to the user so that they don't get freaked out? Don't creep out the user is like a typical uh, industry response as well. And I think that this is only now coming um, and this will require us to f push and this will require us to do a great job <laughs> and this will require us to, um, I'm not sure if, it, if we can just rely on regulators, but I think maybe all, also like to push these kind of technologies. So the answer is yes, they're interested in privacy, but on certain kinds, and we need to push for the others. And, and this is not easy. I think everybody in this room would agree this is not easy. And if industry keeps on saying they are giving privacy as confidentiality tools, but the code is closed, it's hard to believe as well. Right. So those are, those are the limitations. All right. We're all okay. done. Let's thank Seda.